good evening everyone um a warm welcome to all of those who joined us today at science gallery bengaluru's exhibition season contagion we hope you are all staying safe and staying at home uh this is our second discussion part of our film screening series at contagion so contagion is our first fully online digital exhibition season that's on till the 13th of june and explores the transmission of diseases emotions and behaviors as a part of this exhibition season we have a film series that is screening five different films for the entirety of 45 days we also have discussions with filmmakers and academics that opens up bigger questions that are explored in these films as a part of the film series this time we have the movies um, the periwig maker a human question where birds dance their last disease and survivors survivors is the fifth film in our series that we are going to be discussing today uh i would like to welcome uh professor david hayman david is a medical epidemiologist and a professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine he is a distinguished fellow at the center of universal health at chatham house and was <coughs> chairman of the board of public health england from 2009 to 2015 He has held various leadership positions in infectious diseases at the WHO, and in 2003 headed the WHO Global Response to SARS in his role as Executive Director of Communicable Diseases. In 1976, after spending two years working in India on smallpox eradication, David was a member of the CDC Atlanta team to investigate the first Ebola outbreak. in the democratic republic of congo and stayed on in sub saharan africa for 13 years in various field research positions on ebola lassa fever malaria and other tropical diseases uh we were to be joined by arthur pratt as well the filmmaker however arthur is unable to make it and we hope that he would be able to join us later in case you miss watching the film before joining us for this discussion I would like to encourage you to watch the film, which will be available to view online till June thirteenth. The link will be in the chat box, so please do check it out. So today we are going to uh, we have the opportunity to speak to Professor Heyman, who would tell us a bit about uh, both his experience uh, investigating the very first outbreak of Ebola, but also his thoughts and insights on the film and what it might. talk to us about the pandemic that we are currently experiencing globally so i like to start by asking professor heyman to share with us um some key insights from the first uh, outbreak and his investigation of the same well, thanks very much madhu yeah thank you in fact uh, the first outbreak occurred in 1976 as you said madhu and that outbreak was quite different than the outbreaks today number 1 it occurred when there was no social media when there was no email and so correspondence was really actually very slow but what happened was jean jacques moyembe who was a virologist and a doctor in kinshasa the capital city of drc was called to a mission hospital in the north of drc where there was an outbreak of serious illness that had killed four catholic sisters and one father he went up to the site and i see arthur's joined us now so maybe i'll just uh, end my discussion briefly by saying he went up to the site and jean jacques moyembe was the first western trained physician to see the ebola virus in patients and he collected specimens and sent them off to it and to where i was working at the center for disease control to the uk and to belgium So back to you, Madhu. Arthur, we're so glad that you're able to join us. Are you able to hear us, Arthur? Yes, uh, I think I'm getting you. Okay. Uh, I let me quickly introduce our filmmaker, Arthur Pratt. Arthur is the co-founder of the Freetown Media Center in Sierra Leone, which serves as a hub for local production media education and professional development where he serves as manager in charge of education and creative initiative starting as a playwright stage director and actor arthur has helped develop and acted in three short films 
which was shown in the Madrid Film Festival in 2009-2010. The films are Charity, Bend Down the Corner, and The Cripple and the Witch Hunter. Arthur's interest has then grown from displaying his talents in front of the camera to be the man working behind them. We're very glad to have Arthur here to be in discussion with David to speak about the film Survivors. Um, I would like to start by asking David, uh, Arthur, uh, are you able to hear us and is your connection strong? Yes, um, I'm getting you at the moment. The connection is like strong right now. All right, great. So maybe I could start uh, by just a, a first question. If you could share with us a bit about your experience and your motivation for the way in which you captured the experiences of the community that were in Sierra Leone who lived through the Ebola outbreak. Uh, can, can you just please come again with the question? Could you share with us your motivation for this particular approach in capturing the experiences of the communities who lived through the, the outbreak in Sierra Leone? All right, okay. So um, the, 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 the approach we took was uh, because we found out that in the very first place, um, Many a times our stories are being told from like a third person perspective. Um, you know, um, foreign filmmakers are just used to come into our localities, come into our country and um, um, do films about situations and issues. And uh, for me, most of these films lack um, a typical African perspective. It lacks the, the, the actual perspective of people who are actually going through these issues. That's the first thing. And uh, secondly, Again, tied to that, it was intentional that we get the, the voices of people in the communities. We see how the communities themselves are reacting and what are their thoughts and their actions, you know. And so therefore we chose to follow um, certain people that we believe, um, uh, we believe that their voices um, could be heard as community voices, their, their, their perspectives and what they are going through again, actually, what they were going through um, could also be seen as what um, um, the communities, you know, have been going through. And through them, we'll see the different communities. So that was why we chose um, not to have any, um, like, government officials in the film, uh, because basically we don't want the film to be politicized. And we want to make sure that um, um, whatever information we are passing on is original, it's not political. And um, we also try our best to limit um, professionals because um, um, this is an outbreak, this is a new outbreak um, in Sierra Leone for the first time. And uh, so therefore it was very important that we see how people react with it for the fact that I was um, working on information earlier before I started doing the film, when we found out that um, the information going out concerning the outbreak itself was kind of confusing at the time. So it was very important for me to, to see how people understand the information and how people were accepting the information, you know. So our approach to the film itself was purely based on, um, I'll say, based on our experiences and what we actually wanted to bring out. Thank you, Arthur. Um, David, would you like to? Yes, uh, Arthur, I think the film is very powerful and it's a very strong film because you have left the politics out and you've gone right to the real heart of the matter. And, and congratulations on a very excellent film that shows how terrible this infection really is. You know, I went back, uh, I was at the first outbreak and the second and the third outbreaks in DRC. And they were entirely different, as you know, because uh, back then there was no social media, there was no immediate contact. And it took a while to get information and then to get back into the field to see what was going on. The first outbreak, the discoverer is actually an African, Jean-Jacques Moyembe, who um, collected a blood specimen from a sister who died, a Catholic sister, who was dying at one of the missions in Northern DRC at that time called Zaire. And he collected the blood and then dispatched it to the Center for Disease Control where I was, to Belgium and to UK. 
And analysis in the laboratory showed that this was a virus that looked like a known virus, the Marburg virus, but in effect, uh, Pat Webb, who was one of the virologists at CDC, identified it as a new virus. But the discoverer was an African, and I think it's very important because many other people have attempted to claim discovery when actually it was Jean-Jacques Moyembe who did it. Okay, and by me, let me see if I... Arthur, are you able to hear us? Okay, now I, I get you now. Is, is there a question? Is, yeah. is the line cut off at some point? I think uh, what is important as David sort of brought out is the contributions of the people of Africa which towards the understanding of Ebola, right? And I think what your film shows very well is how it's not just those who are studying the disease, but those on the ground, right? Who were able to take on small but extremely important roles in the care of the public during this disease. So could you tell us maybe a bit more about how you also chose these particular stories that you captured and what they speak to the larger narrative of Ebola in Sierra Leone? Yes, so um, uh, first of all, sorry Dave, uh, I've not been able to, the line is uh, sometimes goes very weak and um, it's not like a stable. So um, in Sierra Leone, basically, one of the things you, like, like I said earlier, and it's, it's, it's quite a new disease, but one of the things we should understand is that um, um, when um, people are going through issues um, within their families, the first respondent is always um, their families and then their neighbors. And um, um, also, it's also important for us to note that um, um, the, the medical sector in this part of the world is, uh, for me, I'll say it's very weak. It's weak to the point that um, many people have lost confidence in um, the medical sector. They've lost confidence in going to the hospitals. This, this is due to um, different kind of um, um, uh, um, issues that they face. For example, um, um, nurses are not like professional in their approach. They can be very, very arrogant. They can be very, very rude. And um, uh, um, also, um, uh, Finances um, are all quite key. These are all like important um, um, issues to consider. So many people in, in, in Sierra Leone don't actually go to the hospital. People actually diagnose themselves when uh, they have um, um, issues. So for example, if I'm feeling a little bit feverish, what I know is I must treat myself for malaria, even though it might not be malaria, even though probably it might be something that has to do with your kidney or your liver or something otherwise, but I'll be treating myself for malaria. And that's the reason why many people um, died. So um, taking all of that into context, knowing fully well that um, um, when, when did the Ebola stroke, people denied it and they, they, they thought it's because it's symptoms similar malaria, they thought they can just treat it with regular malaria drugs, you know. So you have many nurses and doctors going, many nurses going into families and homes that they've been treating outside the hospital to treat people. And so these nurses also got infected and they died. And many people got infected. In, in fact, that was how the, um, the virus actually spread. And, and it reaches a point in which, uh, um, uh, that um, um, it, it's, it was like going out of control. That was when Melson San Frontier, you know, San Frontier start coming in and stepping up. So for us in, in choosing our, 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 our stories, it was very important for us to um, understand what, what were the relationship with the people and the medical sector, and also uh, the issues of trust in the entire thing, the issues of trust, uh, um, where people like trusting, because I could remember that, um, 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 when we add um, the issue, issues of polio and um, um, also how to deal with malaria, the government by then used um, community theater to pass on this information. That was how, in fact, polio was defeated in Sierra Leone. And that was how, in fact, we started having people um, um, gaining the right knowledge on malaria and how to treat malaria. So um, I, I was thinking that the government would allow 
will get um, um, the same community theater groups to deal with these issues in the communities. But then they tribalize it and they give monies to um, parliamentarians and ministers who then use these monies to um, do just buy basic Veronica buckets and do a little bit of sensitization with music. And uh, during these sensitizations, people were dancing with this music. And so uh, um, generally the public look at it as something that is not serious, it's a joke. Because if you're dancing with songs that has to deal with life issues, you know, for them, it's, it's, this, is, this is all a joke. So people are not taking it very serious. So all of these issues, you know, help us to look at what kind of stories we deal with. In terms of the ambulance, we, we found out that um, when Ebola stroke, Sierra Leone had like um, zero ambulance, professional ambulance. We have like 11 land cruisers that had nothing you would call an ambulance. So these are just like land cruisers uh, and that they took out the back seats. You know, and then create the space. So we don't call the I don't call them ambulances because they were not ambulances professionally. So we had only like one professional ambulance in the country, and uh, they were looking for um, people to volunteer for ambulance drivers to volunteer. So they had their own kind of stories. There are ambulance drivers who died because um, Ebola infected um, um, passengers or, or, or a patient. You know, spat spit at them and uh, they got infected. Some got infected. These are like just direct contact. You are driving and just after your seats, you're carrying something like 12 people at the back of your Land Rover, at the back of your seat, you know, carrying all of this number of people at the back of seats, looking at the risk, looking at what was happening to them and how it relates to their families, you know, how their wives are taking it at home. For some of them, they, 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 were, they were given out of their families, especially those that we are living with extended families. These guys are like all driven away from their families, kicked out of their homes. So it becomes this um, frustration and people were afraid to work in the medical sector. There, 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 there was serious issues of stigmatization. People who have been stigmatized, nurses who have been driven out of their homes, entire communities found as people, people working within the burial teams who are given names, they were given um, uh, names that, that identify them. So it was complete madness. It was complete crazy. And so for us, it was quite important that we uh, um, look at um, um, stories that are related to the communities, but also tied to the outbreak itself and how the communities were like actually coping with it, you know. So at some point, we that, that's why we started our film with a, a strong symbol of our religious tolerance. You, you find out that at the start of the film, it started with a prayer, a Christian prayer and a Muslim prayer. So because religious tolerance played a very key role in dealing with the outbreak itself in Sierra Leone. You know, the inter-religious council you know, was contacted. They played this vital role in going to communities, talking about it in churches, in mosques, in communities, getting people to be able to deal with it, you know. So those are the, 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 the ideas, our concepts that tied uh, our story that enable us to, to pick out um, the stories. If you, when you watch the film, you'll notice that there are short interviews with certain people. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was also important that these people who we are being quarantined at the time, who we are going through the situation themselves, it was very important that we get their voice, that we know what was going on with them in their homes, how they envisage it. What, what, what was it like before and what is it like now? You know, what's the risk and all of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. David, if I might ask you to also comment, because what Arthur said it clearly shows the importance of public health messaging, communities, as well as organizations that are stepping into aid countries at this moment, that they have to work together. And it's very important that there is collaboration and clear communication between these uh, various parties. So what, what has been your experience and insight into this? Thank you uh, very much, Madhu, and thanks, Arthur. In fact, I'd like to build on two words that Arthur used. One was trust, and one was malaria. And you know, Arthur, what you said is true. If there isn't trust in the communities, then they don't want to collaborate and work with the outbreak containment teams. And Jean-Jacques Moyembe taught me something very early at the second outbreak of Ebola already. He taught me that you need to speak, and you said this in the film as well, at the level of the people who you're dealing with. And so if you go to an outbreak of Ebola in rural DRC uh, with Jean-Jacques Moyembe, his first stop 
is not at the hospital. His first stop is at the district commissioners. And he tells the district commissioner to call together the chiefs, the traditional chiefs from all the villages in the area that he would like to speak with them. When they come together, he then talks with them about Ebola, but in their terms. And their terms are as follows. He says, these people who are sick are filled with evil spirits who are trying to get out of their bodies. And they get out of the body. If you touch that person, then those spirits go into your body. And so then Zhajak says, if you want to get rid of this disease, you must work with the teams coming in. You must remember not to touch the people who are sick or their dead bodies or those spirits will come into you. And by doing that, in their understanding, he's very easy for him to stop the outbreaks. And he stops outbreaks in a very short period of time in rural DRC. <coughs> the second term you raised was malaria. And just a little bit about malaria, as we all know, it causes lots of fever. And that's the reason, in fact, that these outbreaks occur, because health workers don't recognize this as being um, Ebola. They think it's a common infection, maybe malaria, maybe something else, and they become infected. And then they infect other people inadvertently, either in their families or in the hospital. And the, the, the way that this has been demonstrated is between 1980 and 1985, in Northern DRC, there was research looking at every person who developed signs and symptoms of Ebola in a series of villages around a hospital in Tandala. Each person identified in the community was then taken to the hospital isolated and examined for Ebola. But at the same time, there was an investigation in the community. Out of 94 people who developed these signs and symptoms, 21 had Ebola. But because they were isolated in the hospital, the disease didn't transmit further. There was no amplification into an outbreak. And most outbreaks occur, as you know, in Sierra Leone as well, because unsuspecting health workers get infected and it's a tragedy. They die and they infect other patients and their families inadvertently. Madhu. Yes, Atta, are you, are you able to hear? Yes, um, yeah, I'm here. So um, I also um, wanted to ask you about, I mean, the fact is, like you said, the film has, especially the thing about the ambulances, right? Like how this idea that certain things came into being once the outbreak began, and this wasn't something that existed before, and the outbreak actually yeah. led to these developments happening. Uh, how, how do you, uh, how, what other insights have you captured about this through your film? And do you see, do you see an impact of having captured these stories to what you have on ground today? Well, um, basically the, the outbreak itself, um, uh, helped us to be able to see what was going on within our medical sector and then um, um, be able to critically scrutinize our priorities, you know, especially when it comes to um, the security and health of our medical personnel and also um, uh, making sure that we have the right mechanism in place to deal with um, outbreaks or to deal with whatever was going on or whatever is going on in the country. So, by, but at that time, we came to realize that ambulances were like um, an issue, and it was an issue that was solved as the the um, the outbreak um, um, goes on. Um, governments then had to purchase some amount of ambulance through the help of the United States government, and uh, I think Nigeria also, and then um, other countries like um, China and Japan, you know, also came in big time with ambulances, and those ambulances are still here with us. They are being used now to help um, pregnant women in different places. And those were the same ambulances used during this um, um, corona um, outbreak um, that we had. Um, but also, like I said, it, it, it's the, the outbreak itself helped to improve the, the consciousness of our medical practitioners, you know, so and, and their attitude towards work and their attitude towards um, um, patients. As um, many of them, for example, our, our, our central female character, Margaret, 
you know, immediately after the outbreak, she starts working with HIV and AIDS, and she's still working with HIV and AIDS as um, a senior um, counseling nurse. She's a counselor and a nurse at the same time, because all of the counseling tricks that she develops during the outbreak itself, you know, has been able to in, um, inform her to, 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 to deal with people going through different kind of um, contagious diseases, you know, and so she's been very, very key within the uh, um, HIV and AIDS um, 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 sector here in Sierra Leone um, as well. So we, we see the, the introduction of triage in our medical system. So for example, there, um, before the outbreak, you just jump and go in to see a doctor. You know, but now um, triages have been introduced in many, many um, hospitals. You don't just go in again and see any, any, uh, any doctor. You need to go through a proper um, kind of system, you know, so that you are. And then um, we know that the security of um, our medical practitioners are in place. So there has been a lot of in, 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 um, improvement, but um, um, sadly, there has been a little improvement with regards. Um, understanding this um, that particular outbreak, forgetting that um, um, Ebola will, 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 well, people are saying it will certainly um, um, rise up again because we've seen the example in the Congo where you have one outbreak, two outbreak, and just before the, the COVID, we had another outbreak. So um, why am, am I saying this is um, because the, um, people are not dealing with lesson learned much in the Ebola, except for that which deals directly with the medical sector. But that's that which deals with the, the public uh, uh, directly is becoming a problem. For example, when we had the, 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 um, the COVID outbreak, we thought that um, the pattern of um, um, dealing with communities and um, community-based organizations, you understand me, and all of that will be copied and implemented. But it was totally abandoned. It's, it's uh, what happened in Sierra Leone during this COVID was, like everything was done forcefully by government, you understand me? And for me, I think it's just, for me, I'll, I'll say it's the grace of God that helped us in, in such a way that the COVID does not get out of hand. Because if, if it would have gotten out of hand, it would have been a worse disaster. Because um, information, everything become politicized, you know, and everything become politicized. The government dealt with everything in their own way which MM creates serious problem. And it's up to now it creates, there is the issue of, there is serious doubt about the reality of COVID. There is serious doubt about how it's affecting people and all of that. Well, with the film, what we did was we, we gave the film out to um, the um, four, three major television stations in Sierra Leone for them to hear the film out throughout this outbreak. The film has been aired out throughout this outbreak. And the film itself has made serious impact, you know, reminding people about the outbreak, reminding people about what you stand to gain or lose if you are infected or affected in any way, you know. So it's 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 it plays its own role in, in, in awareness raising and getting people, you know, to take caution, to forget about politics and take the necessary precaution so that, you know, um, they are not um, um, infected, you know. And um, one of the things that David said that that um, gets to my mind was the issue of how you approach um, um, people, you know, with their own kind of language and in, in their own terms. And that's that's very very um, important. I, I I do remember that um, um, we did a short film in which I played a character called Asan. And that film became very, very impactful. It was played throughout the entire outbreak and people watched it and learned from it. I played the role of Asan, a character who'd, who'd been infected, gone through the medical sector and came out. And in places like this, if people do not see an example, if you do not hold on, if there is no way you can hold on to something you believe in, it's gonna be very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh Thank you, Arthur. That, that was very insightful and it really sort of brings to the forefront how, how much we may have or may not have learned from past outbreaks and how this has influenced the global handling of this pandemic, not just in Sierra Leone, but all over the world as well. Um, so 
um david would you like to add particularly anything about the case of stigma around these diseases especially with those who are working in the front line um given that you've been on the ground and you would have been there as well what what what, what are your thoughts on that well, you know it's it's very important to present to prevent stigmatization and lots of uh, ebola patients the survivors are still stigmatized today and that's because number one they had a disease which people didn't really understand and they were afraid and number two they know that some people can harbor the virus long term and continue uh, with that virus long term so their stigmatization was very important and it's very important with any infection really i can remember when in 2003 when sars emerged for the first time mm -hmm. It was very important to give it a name that would stigmatize it. So names are also very important. And for Ebola, uh, Ebola we named for a river beside the mission where the outbreak occurred in DRC rather than calling it Congo fever or something else. And SARS in 2003, we called severe acute respiratory syndrome. Instead of letting the press name it or some other person name it as Chinese flu or Chinese infection. So it's very important, as Arthur said, not to stigmatize people and to make sure that survivors are heroes and not um, pushed aside by society. And I think Arthur's done that very well in the film. Arthur, um, I have... Um another question for you uh, and after this we'll uh, kind of there are a lot of questions from the participants as well so i'll um, open up the floor to questions from our attendees i, I just wanted to ask what was the uh, sort of uh, reaction when uh, the who declared that the, uh, the ebola epidemic was uh, over in sierra leone and how what was the sort of uh, the impact of that on community members, those who've been on the front lines, who've been working tirelessly during this, and what was this, the impact on that? And do you think that is something you would have liked to capture on film as well? Well, yes, definitely. So um, when, when the Ebola ended, it was all joy, uh, which, well, well, I'll say it was a mixed feeling of joy and sadness. Um, joy mostly because people, you know, many people survived. It's ended, you know, the trauma of going through all of the kind of lockdown, being afraid to touch people. Because for us in Africa, um, touching each other, that, that, that was what I said in the film. It's very, very important. You know, it's, it's quite impossible for us to meet without having some form of physical contact. You know, a handshake is, is, is most common. You know, bodily contact is very, very common. And it's, it's a sign of trust. So it's, 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 it's like a relief to return back to the status quo. You return back to everything normal. But then uh, the way the outbreak was dealt with had its impact, which, which um, went on for quite a long time, for more than one year. So for example, um, there was a time when um, um, a rule or an order was, was passed that said, um, if you know of anybody who got sick, you should report the person, you know, or you should just secretly call 119, which was the emergency number by then and uh, for them. And so many people called 119, many sick people were taken away and many of the sick people died. And so because they died, entire communities turned on families or individuals, accusing them of the death of their loved ones, of the death of their relatives. Um, we must remember at this point that um, um, when the outbreak started, People were taken into the communities, and because it was new, many people died in the beginning. And so there was the rumor that people were being injected or being killed in the medical facilities, you know. And so because um, people died, the, 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 there has been serious issues with communities and communities leaders. For example, we went to a particular community in which the chief in the community was not in peace with a particular section of the of, of the part of the village. There are people in the village who are very hostile to that particular chief. And so the chief could not go within that particular area just because they accuse him of the death of their loved ones. And there are other villages that I also witnessed in which two villages were not talking. 
the, the road that leads to both villages to both villages was like cut off. You cannot cross that path to go to the next village. They were very hostile to each other, just because of and one village pointed at another. That the sick, that the the outbreak, the, the the infection came from that village to this village, you know. And so there 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 were a lot of um, social issues, a lot of issues that had to be dealt with traditionally. So at the end of the day, well, well we had few organizations that um, um, took it upon themselves um, to go out. And we also went out while we were doing uh, the series called We Survive, which is um, a particular series in which we are gathering information on uh, people infected and affected. You know, we, we did, um, it's not a document, it's just um, um, doing interviews with people who are infected and affected. Um, luckily for us, Emory University in the US is now hosting that particular um, um, information that we got. So that was when we, we, we found those stories and that was when we um, now decided to intervene. I could also remember that I went to shoot a short film in a particular village and I met that particular incident and we had to intervene. We had to um, re-educate you know, or, or, it, the, the people as to what actually went on and how it was not the fault of the chief and how they should see the action of the chief you know, as being heroic rather than a villain you know, at the end of the day. So these were like the problems that we face, but also, um, there was also the there is also the problem of neglect. For example, up to now, Ebola infected people are being stigmatized in hospitals. Many of them go to hospitals. Okay, for example, after the outbreak, we had this law in which every Ebola infected person must be treated freely in hospitals. So many of them go to the hospitals. There are no drugs. Sometimes they they they, they had a special area designed for them only. So when you sit in that area, everybody knows that you are an Ebola infected person. You understand me? So the stigmatization is still on. And um, um, they, they are not having um, um, enough um, uh, uh, medical attention. Because when we did the We Survive series, we also found out that um, um, many of them are complaining of different kinds of ailments. Some people have gone blind. Some have gone deaf. Some are losing their manhood. They are becoming... seems that Arthur's connection may have broken. Uh, David, are you able to hear him? Yes. Um, so I oh. think that, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. Okay. Okay. I think we'll just wait to see if Arthur is able to rejoin us. It seems that his internet connection might have um, broken in the meanwhile. Um, maybe I will take some questions from the audience. Um, till then. Uh, it looks like Arthur is back. Um, there might be some that uh, there, there are some questions here that I think David would like to take. Um, one of our attendees have asked, what, what must be the ultimate response to a pandemic? Is it different in every case or must it be the same? How can we coordinate these efforts? So given that we've seen the difference that Arthur brought out about the response to Ebola versus the current situation with COVID, uh, is there really an ultimate response to a pandemic? The ultimate response to any infectious disease outbreak, including a pandemic, is when the people begin to understand how the disease is transmitted and whether they're at risk and how they can protect others. And that's the basis of all outbreaks. So for example, in the current COVID outbreak, if you know that it's being transmitted by groups of young people together who are singing or dancing or speaking to together in a loud voice, then you want to avoid that. And if you can't avoid that, then you want to be sure that if you have been exposed, that you wear a mask to protect others afterwards, especially the elderly in the household. So the basis of all outbreak containment and pandemic entrainment is understanding how to do your own risk assessment to see whether you're at risk of infection. And if you are, then you must undertake measures to protect others, physically distance from them and wear a mask so that you don't cough or sneeze and spread the virus to others. Those are basic understandings. Then there's other measures that can be done, but the government, instead of locking down, really needs to get people to understand themselves 
how they can protect others and protect themselves. So at the start, there are lockdowns, but then those lockdowns should transfer to the people so that they understand how to protect others and themselves. We have, thank you, David. We have another question that asks um, whether, in, in a sense that, um, is there a difference in the interest of globally to prevent outbreaks in poorer regions of the world where the impact of this disease may not affect so much the development or the economy of that country. So what are your thoughts? It's a, yeah, it's important that we work together everywhere. We have a good vaccine, for example, for COVID-19. And by the way, India is the biggest producer of vaccines in the world. So the world depends on India to produce vaccines, not only for India, but for the rest of the world. So we have a vaccine, we have several vaccines. We also have some diagnostic tests, which make it easier to deal with this outbreak, but these are not equitably distributed throughout the world. And that's the responsibility of the international community. Solidarity must rule in this and make sure that countries that are hoarding vaccines do share their vaccines. It's only normal that political leaders want to protect their people and want to get vaccines but they should do that in a way that doesn't prevent others from getting vaccines as well. And so we've got a big challenge in front of us today. India has a challenge to get its vaccines to the people in India, but also to contribute to that global stockpile of vaccines that can benefit other countries as well. Um, we have another question and it, it uh, attendee asks whether is it only a weak healthcare system that underserves its population. That is the cause of a pandemic. Well, you know, it depends on who you ask. Um, if you ask me that today, I would say no. I said the evidence is that the countries with the highest mortality are industrialized countries. The UK has a very high mortality from COVID. The United States has a very high uh, mortality, as do the lower and, and the middle income countries, such as India and Brazil. So mortality and, and this outbreak is being very poorly managed by industrialized and semi-industrialized countries. But countries in Asia that had SARS and MERS coronavirus outbreaks in the past seem to be much more prepared. When WHO announced on the 5th of January last year that there was a new infection, immediately the countries in Asia, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam began to do good surveillance and they found cases and they stopped them immediately. And they decreased mortality throughout the period of time. Whereas the UK, the US watched those early cases and didn't really respond, waiting to see what was happening. and it crept up on them and they had huge outbreaks before they knew it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that a low resource country is the country where these outbreaks are most serious. In the case of COVID, it's been in industrialized countries. We have uh, another question that came quite early on. Uh, so the attendee asks, uh, says rather than Sierra Leone and I mean of course the African subcontinent is a very diverse and dispersed region and the containment therefore of contagions in this is it affected by this characteristic of the the geography of the country in itself? Well it, it is it is to a certain extent the severity of a disease is because governments are interested or not interested in the health of their people. As we all know, the health ministries are the weakest funded, the lowest funded ministries in most countries, unfortunately. If you look at defense, it's way up high. If you look at other uh, activities, very high. Health usually comes out very low. I know Sierra Leone quite well because in the 1970s, I was there for some studies on the Lassa fever virus, which is a virus that causes hemorrhagic fevers in a certain number of people. And there, there's been mistrust for many, many years for many different reasons. There's been diamond fields in Sierra Leone where there's been robbery of diamonds and, and not lack of trust in, in people working with the government and without the government. And this happens in all countries. The, most, the best countries though, are those countries that have a government 
which cares about its people and which develops the capacities to deal with outbreaks and diseases in hospitals. So, you know, I think going forward, we can hope that all countries understand that it's their role to make sure that their country never has another pandemic disease such as COVID-19. Thank you, David. Uh, that was really insightful. And I'm, uh, I'm a little sad that Arthur is unable to rejoin us. But I believe that is most likely due to technical difficulties. Nevertheless, uh, it was wonderful having you and Arthur here to bring such um, a unique insight into the film. And I'd like to encourage everyone here who was able to join the discussion, if you've not yet seen the film, to definitely watch the film to better understand the nuances of the experiences of the people in Sierra Leone. I'd also like to encourage everyone to watch the other films on which are available to, and are being screened as a part of Contagion. Uh, they explore everything from, again, uh, the language and metaphor around diseases, the plague in London, and zoonotic diseases. So do check them all out. And if, you, if you've been intrigued by our discussion around Ebola today, don't miss the lecture by Adia Benton, who also talks about the configuration of care during the detection and investigation of AIDS and Ebola in Africa. So uh, we also have a lecture happening later on today evening by Professor George Lomnusov from the John Innes Center, which looks at the history of viruses. So please do join us for that as well. Thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure having you here with us today. And uh, I, hopefully we are all a little more aware and we understand a little better about the experiences that are that happened during various kinds of pandemics and hopefully we will learn some lessons from this for the ones that we are going through right now thank you so much and the please do fill up the feedback form as well which is in the chat and let us know how you enjoyed today's session what you thought about the film and what we can do better going forward have a good weekend thank you goodbye